Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. None of us seem to be immune from the avalanche of information and disinformation flowing like a river through the media. With so many churches closed and the flock scattered, there's a shift and a drift taking place among believers. The Word cautions us in Romans 12 and 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. <clears throat> are we able to tune in to the good and acceptable and perfect will of God if we are so distracted by the current conditions impacting our everyday life? David Chadwick is the pastor of Moments of Hope Church in North Charlotte, North Carolina. He's been a pastor for 40 years. He played basketball under the legendary coach Dean Smith at the University of North Carolina, was a member of the Final Four 1969 team. David also has a graduate counseling psychology degree from the University of Florida and a master's of divinity and doctors in ministry from Columbia Theological Seminary. These postgraduate degrees have allowed David to combine therapeutic counseling theories with biblical truth. He's the author of nine books and hosts a weekly talk show on faith and values on WBT in Charlotte, North Carolina. Joining us now, as he does on the second Thursday of every month on the 10 o'clock hour, is the author of Moving Beyond Anxiety, Dr. David Chadwick. My good friend David, good to see you. How are you and Marilyn doing? We are well, thank you, Eric. Continuing to move forward in the pandemic, claiming Genesis 26, where it says there was a famine in the land and Isaac and Rebekah settled in you know the area of the Philistines. And then it says, and God multiplied them in the next year a hundredfold. So we're believing God blesses even in a pandemic. Absolutely. You know, this, this whole scenario uh, has gotten people questioning. What's interesting is, is during the pandemic, there's been a shortage of toilet paper, paper towels, and Bibles. Those are the three most common out-of-stock items in the stores. Now you say to yourself, well, that's really interesting, uh, Bibles. But bi people aren't reading Bibles. They're buying Bibles, but they're just not reading Bibles. And it's a really interesting phenomena. I think it's the same phenomena that took place in my mother's day uh, where she had a Bible, and I think it was somewhere, she's 94, um, somewhere in the Depression period, the synagogues all stockpiled Bibles and made sure that everybody had a Bible. But I had her, must have been 75-year-old Bible that I have now, it was never opened. Mm -hmm. The beautiful red on the edge of the paper, the black thick, you remember the black thick hard cover, right. pebbled hard cover, uh, but she had never opened it. I was the first one to open it. I actually use it, and her name's on the front of it, I actually use it for weddings and funerals. I think it's, it's uh, kind of a historical relic in my family uh, that I use kind of as a uh, formal Bible. Uh, but God is at work, and he's obviously sovereign, and talks about these times that we're in, but happens to talk about them in regards to the last days. We see the word pestilence, and pestilence is the category of plagues. So we're seeing that, and people are questioning. You and I had this uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, the people are questioning about the end times and about prophecy and about what's going to happen, and is this a move towards a prophetic alignment? And people are anxious about it because they don't know what it means. Uh, many of the pulpits have shied away from teaching uh, end time prophecy. Uh, and I know you are now delving into that with your congregation. You can see the excitement, the enthusiasm, people saying, yeah, I really want to know. I want to know. I, 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 I watched the Left Behind series. Is, that wasn't, it, was that biblical? Was that not biblical? Is, is that what's going to happen? Is this, this 
you know, I want to call it the Hoover in the sky. Is it going to come along and, and suck everybody out? Um, so there's a lot of questions in trying to make sense of it. And it's really a rather complex issue going back to Daniel and understanding what Daniel was talking about uh, in his interpretation of the vision given to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's kind of the starting point. Most people think the starting point is in the words of Jesus or in the words of Paul or really in John's words in the book of Revelation. But it really is an interconnected thing and people are wondering. And there is, to the point of anxiety, uh, people are somewhat anxious about mm. what's happening. Um, I wish we could get people to open up their Bibles, Eric, where they would see that the Bible is a book which shares a history of a people fulfilled in Jesus and then the church moving forward to take this message of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and the forgiveness of our sins throughout the world. If they would know that the Bible's message is really about salvation, it's about how people can spend eternity with God in heaven and have their sins forgiven. And that it is for every person who wants to read it, they can find their story and God's story. Um, if we could get people to read that, how much of their anxieties would decrease because they would see a God who is sovereign over salvation history and sovereign over their lives and is working all things together for good and for his glory. Um, you're so right that it is interesting that God began the whole prophecy motif in Daniel while the Jews were in captivity. I'm sure a desperate people wondering what in the world's going on, like what we're seeing today. And as you mentioned, I'm doing a prophecy class now at Moments of Hope Church. And uh, when I announced it, within 24 hours, there were 150 people who signed up and it's full. Uh, people want to know, but I think they also want to know how to deal with a God who is sovereign during these times of anxiety. And end times should teach us that the Lord knows, he oversees all, and we need to let him control the day and the hour, and therefore we can rest in the security of casting all our anxieties upon him who cares so deeply for us. You know, the message of the end times is really not about the end times. The message of the end times is be prepared. The message of the end times is that there are things going to be that are going to happen. Uh, there are many different views about the timing of certain events. And one of the things that I say to people is that when you find multiple positions on a particular area of scripture, statistically, somebody's got to be wrong. In the area of uh, the rapture or pre-tribulation, mid-trib, uh, 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 post-trib, all that, the camps are almost evenly divided, and there's almost five camps. That would mean that almost 80% are wrong. Right. So when I approach this, and I mentioned to you that, that you know I'm one that has a certain belief system, and I, I sent you a, a, a lengthy document about what I believe, but I don't share that on the air because I'm not going to weigh into the, well, this scripture and that scripture. What I'm weighing into is two parables that Jesus gave us that ensured us that we would be prepared and not anxious. The first one is the parable of the ten virgins. Mm -hmm. Five virgins had their lamps full, didn't know the time, didn't know the hour, but were ready. Five did not. And when the time came upon them, suddenly they heard the announcement that the groom was coming and they tried to bargain for oil and then had to scurry away and probably missed out on whatever the opportunity was and when they would return the door would be shut. That's an end time preparation message. It says, look, w w there's stuff going on. The Bible clearly tells us there's events that have to happen and there's a sequence of events. 
the son of perdition has to be revealed. The, the campaign of Armageddon has to take place. Uh, there's an event which will trigger Matthew 23, 37 through 39, where the Jews cry for Jesus to return. He comes to redeem the tents of Jerusalem first. So, you know, where does that play in all this and what does that mean? Then there was the parable of the, um, I'm not sure how they named it. Is it the wicked servant or is it the wicked master? But uh, the master has gone a long time. It becomes the third watch and the overseer is drunk and beating his servants when the master comes home. Uh, he didn't know the hour. He didn't know the time, but he took advantage of it and wasn't prepared and didn't go well for him. So, you know, we talk about these watches, and in Israel they have the ramparts. And so as they, the watches were set up where you m walked the ramparts around the city, uh, pieces of the ramparts are there. We walk the ramparts when we go to Israel. And it was about being ready, being prepared, being on the lookout for the signs that the enemy was going to attack. Like the watchman on the wall. Watchman on the wall. So there's great comfort in preparation. There's great anxiety in blind anticipation. And you're, you and I are concerned with the passage of be anxious for nothing. Well, if, if there's going to be somebody that's going to rise up and there's going to be trouble and people are going to have to take a mark and they're concerned about, you know, are they going to do it through a vaccine? And the answer is no, they're not. You have to, the scriptures, and that's why they have to read the scriptures. You have to willingly take the mark. This is a, you know, do you want it? Here it is. Take it. Uh, it's, it's, a tra it's transactional. It is not sub, sub, uh, subversive. It's transactional. Yeah. So they, they don't really know, and they really need to understand the foundation of it because God gave it to us so that we would be prepared. We could see all these things that are going on around us. We should know that God already foreknew them and was telling us, when you see these things happen, this is not the end. This is the beginning. And so I always think of uh, uh, that, uh, what was it, Otis Redding? People, people get ready, there's a train a coming. Yeah, yeah. You know, we need to be ready. Well, you and I both believe uh, how the scripture teaches that that readiness gives our hearts peace. And as you just shared in one of my favorite parables, the parable of the 10 virgins, you can't purchase the oil of the Holy Spirit who lives in your hearts. Uh, you can't um, have it because you're a family member of somebody who believes it can't be borrowed. Uh, it's got to be believed in by yourself and claimed as truth for yourself. And when you do believe that, then you can be ready because you live in that constant daily intimacy with Jesus. There's that union life with him that allows the oil of the Holy Spirit to burn brightly in your heart every second of every day. And that's what's so important. Uh, but we also believe that, you know, in his coming back, it, it's a good thing. And there is a place that he is preparing for us, whether you believe it's a dwelling place or an actual mansion, it doesn't really matter. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And he is there preparing it for us. But just like in that parable where the son would see the girl and be in that betrothal time period, he would go back to build on an addition to his father's house. Only the father could tell the son when he could come back and fetch his bride. Uh, only he could make that decision. And it's interesting to me how Jesus, as the second person of the Godhead, chose to humble himself and limit some of his knowledge. The fact when he comes back is totally in the father's hand. And he can only come back until the day the father says, all the houses are ready for all of my children. Go fetch your bride. But if he knows that day or the hour, we ought to be able to rest in security, knowing that even though there are signs that indicate something's happening, there are birth pangs of the new creation occurring. There seem to be more frequent earthquakes, for example, that are in humanity, more wars and rumors of wars than ever before. We see the increase of the 
birth pangs, that should alert us. But nevertheless, it still could be 10, 15, 100 years from now, Eric. Only the Father knows, but we rest in the security of his perfect sovereign knowledge. You, um, you bring up an interesting point, is that no one knows the day or the hour. Uh, the current Hebrew calendar is based on a calendar that was developed in 200 AD by Rabbi Hillel. And under that calendar, he changed the dates to conform to a calendar that would move the timeline out about 200 years and change the date of Jesus. It was done very specifically for that, but it's been adopted across. Uh, so when we look at this idea of that we are in the Hebrew year of uh, 50, let me take a look, I always forget. Uh, we are in the Hebrew year of uh, 5781, okay? Uh, there's a passage in Scripture to the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Mm. Now, most seminarians will tell you that their expository teaching on that passage is about God is the God over time. It's related to God's sovereignty over time. But to the Hebrew mind, we take that passage and say, look, God doesn't say anything for nothing. If he wants to say he's God over time, he'll say he's God over time. So what <coughs> other thing would I look at if he's defining a day? Well, he's defined a day in Genesis. That's the first time we see a definition of a day. Now he is amplifying that definition. Are they interconnected? So if I were to interconnect them, I would find something phenomenal. And that is at the end of the sixth day, there is a seventh day rest. So, if I were looking at a mathematical calendar, at the end of 6,000 years, there would be a 1,000 year rest. Mm. The para it's, it's almost called a Y6 care. Mm. I, I believe that based on the biblical calendar, based on a day is like a thousand years, tied to creation, that at the end of 50, 999 going into this year 6000 the sixth the end of 6 days <clears throat> we would enter into that sabbath that would be the millennial reign so i've done a lot of work as have many of my scholarly friends in looking at what the actual calendar is we uh, we've come to some agreement the essenes have the most accurate calendar and it's an arithmetic calendar, and it puts us more in the 59, 50, 59, 60, 59, 70 time realm, uh, leading us to a 25 to 30 year period of time in which all this were to come to pass. Well, when you think about the events leading up to the campaign of Armageddon, uh, the seven year period of three and a half years of peace, three and a half years of trouble, and you start to say, well, you know, listen, even if today the covenant was signed with many, because that's what, that's, that's what starts the clock. Uh, the day of this covenant signed with many, that starts the clock. So that adds seven years to, to the unfolding. Then you have the campaign of Armageddon. That campaign lasts for a period of time until Jesus comes the second time to redeem Israel from the clutches of the armies of the Antichrist to set up his millennial kingdom. So we do have a window. And, and although we say no one knows the day or the hour, no one, it, it could happen even now, even at this moment, except for the fact that the Bible doesn't really tell us that it it says it can happen, but here's the signs of the things that need to kind of line up 
in order for it to happen. And so we're moving closer to those times, right? We're in a window of time. And we know that the fig tree, 1948, Israel, the fig tree blossoms, really kind of sets and says, and he says that um, uh, the generation that sees the fig tree blossom will not pass away until they see the day of the coming of the Lord. Well, what is the day of the coming of the Lord? It's not his appearance, that's the beginning of the tribulation. So as we look at, at, at understanding a lot of very confusing terminology, because we think, oh, that's the day it comes up. No, that's, the, 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 that's when the, all these things start. We should see, I was born in 52, you were born in 49. 49. Okay, so you and I should see in our lifetime, according to that, if we live out to our natural old age, which for you and I, our natural old age should be 90 to 95 years old, based on lifestyle and, and actuarial tables, uh, we should see that happen in our lifetime. But not be anxious about it, be excited about it, and answer the call that's on our life as to what are we supposed to do in the meantime. In the meantime, we're supposed to be about the Father's business. We're not mm -hmm. supposed to be so distracted with COVID and with shutdowns and pestilence and, and storms and locusts and floods and wars and rumors of wars and socialism and all this. We're supposed to be preaching the gospel. That's what exactly. we're supposed to be doing. That, that is the one thing the church has that no one else has. It's the gospel. And what I've seen in my years of ministry, Eric, is when churches and denominations start to make something that's important, make that most important. And the most important thing is the preaching of the gospel. When you talk about eternal separation from God, when you talk about the reality of hell, everything else pales in comparison. But we've seen, and I know you have as well, numbers of churches who start to make social justice issues or concerns for the poor or whatever those might be, they're really important issues, but they're not the most important issue. And you can see how the enemy has slowly but surely gotten the church off focus and moved toward those things and become increasingly powerless and irrelevant. It's amazing to me that I've watched as you have the statistics nosedive. In World War II, there came the expression that there are no atheists in a foxhole. The difficult times are what's supposed to be the catalyst for the explosion of faith. This is the one of the only times, I think, in history that when trouble came, faith waned. It should have been the other way around. When trouble came, faith rises up and people rally. But the way they did this diabolically was they said, okay, trouble comes, let's clamp them down. Mm -hmm. Let's cut them off because as a herd, as a community, they can keep each other going. The pep talks that uh, um, Dean Smith used to give you to keep the team together, okay? He got the whole team together and he gave the pep talks. But imagine if it was just one ball player at a time, but he had to go to one and then to one and then to one There'd be no cohesiveness. Everybody wouldn't be on the same page. Everybody would have, he could have recited the same message to every single one of them, and every one of them would have had a different takeaway. But when he did it to the whole team, the whole team got the message, had the vision, and the takeaway. This is a diabolical divide the body. And it is the source of a great deal of anxiety. There's a social anxiety that now people are afraid to come back out. 
Yep, you've you've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. As a pastor of a local church, I, I can't begin to describe how difficult it is to listen to the cacophony of voices that are out there. You've got some people saying, I'm absolutely not coming to an in-person worship service. I'm afraid to. You've got another group that says, I'll come, but everybody's got to wear a mask, every single person. You've got another group that says, well, I'm willing to come, but you've got to let me choose whether I can wear a mask or not. That's my choice. That's my privilege. Then you've got another group, Eric, that says, I'm not going to come unless everybody doesn't wear a mask. We have that freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and it needs to begin in the church. And you've got four groups out there that are all yelling in the pastor's ears. And that's why, and you've cited this statistic earlier in one of our conversations, one out of every six pastors right now are saying they're not coming back. Once the pandemic lifts, they're just not coming back. They're tired of dealing with the voices. They're tired of trying to please everyone. And mostly as they look at the reality of those four voices, they're saying, I can't do it. So bottom line for me, as I look at it, is the devil's name means the divider. That, that's what his name means. And I think he is behind it all, dividing our nation, dividing people, dividing marriages, dividing churches to get people to go towards selfishness and not towards servanthood. You know, it's interesting that we talk about the book of Genesis as being the story of creation. I think if you say, what's the book of Genesis? They say it's the creation story. But there's only 14 verses of Genesis dedicated to creation. All the other verses in Genesis are devoted to separation. He separated the light from the dark. He separated the water from the land. He separated man from woman. He separated man from God. And then we have this whole pathway of return up to Jesus. Now we have the ultimate clear ensign as to how do we return to God. And we find that it's a very clear proposition. Here's all the ways I gave you. I gave you the law, I gave you your freedom, I gave you um, wealth, I gave you, I, I even laid, allowed you to worship your pagan idols and do all that, but... Um, gave them an eternal land. Right. And, you know, you still, so I'm going to have to do it this way and give you something that you can see, feel, taste, touch, be with you, and maybe then you can grab hold of it. Uh, so we are very much walk by faith, by sight, not by faith. We very much are the ten spies, not the two. Our natural inclination is not to see the, uh, I was telling somebody the other day, you walk into a gorgeous room, amazing room. You're overwhelmed by the artwork on the wall. And human nature is, is uh, excuse me, who's, who's the proprietor here? Who's the manager here? Uh, that picture over there is crooked. Excuse me, can somebody come straighten that picture? Now here you've got Rembrandts and Monet's and you've got all this stuff and the only thing they see is the picture that's crooked. We've gotten such a jauntist eye. We've become such a critical people. If you want to know what's wrong with something, you have a line out the door to tell you what's wrong. But yeah. put the door over here and tell me what's right. Now, I used to have a suggestion box at the congregation. Okay, everybody said you need a suggestion box. So I made a suggestion box. It had no slot in the top of it. It was a solid piece of wood with a lid that did not open, mm. that did not have a slot, but said suggestions. I was trying to send them a message. Sure, I'll comply with your request for a suggestion box, okay? <laughs> but there's no place for you to put it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Eric, they've never erected a statue to a critic. You know that as well as I do. Uh, my dad used to say to me all the time, son, don't worry about what other people are thinking about you. They're not thinking about you. They're too busy thinking about themselves. Amen. It's so true. And, 
you know, we just need to use our lips to build up and to encourage one another. And back to this whole thing of not being able to come together, you know, that is what teams do, not only from the coach to have that encouragement, but they encourage one another. Uh, we get in the huddle together and we speak truth and life to one another. And that just can't happen much now. So all you got are a bunch of people navel gazing, look at the society and think how awful things are. And it only increases their desire to criticize, which is a big example of the fallen human heart. We filed an appeal with the, uh, because we're a uh, broadcast ministry, but I do local teachings and we had been locked out for a year from gathering at the local places because they were uh, not doing in-person services, they weren't doing in-person classes, but I finally was able to uh, file enough appeals to get back to live Monday nights, live Thursday nights, and live Sunday mornings and uh, start regathering. And, you know, we have to comply to their request, which is that people be masked and social distanced. And I'm fine with that. Listen, I'm a man under authority. This is not my, this is not my place. So we're a guest here. We're going to do what the host asks us to do. But people are thrilled with being able to come back together and to be able to learn together. And so we're going to continue in that effort because it, it gives them a sense of community. And Eric, how many have showed up? I'd be curious your percentage now that have begun to come back. I would say we're probably 60, 60% return. That's remarkable. That's very good. That's much higher than the national norm. Yeah, we're about 60, Monday night, six, about 60% have returned. And uh, tonight is the first night I'm back after a year on Thursday nights, but the response to the posting, uh, people are talking about bringing groups together that ha had never been there before because I do um, an expository verse by verse teaching of uh, Jesus and Genesis, uh, the gospel in Exodus, and I do it verse by verse in Hebrew and English. Mm. Uh, so it took us 94 weeks to get through Genesis. Oh my! So mm, it's a almost it's, two years. Yeah, it's a deep dive into mm. the text, and people are hungry. See, people are hungry to get what they've never gotten before. Is you know, Aaron is going through the Gospel of John verse by verse, and my preaching is very simple. I read the verse and explain the verse, and the response. And I've been doing it now for about two months. Has been overwhelming. People just hungering for the Scripture, hungering for biblical truth. And I think you're on to something, as am I. You know, it's interesting. Paul wrote a letter to Timothy, and he said, Until I return, commit yourself to the public reading of Scripture. When I became a believer, and then when I became a congregational rabbi, and I read that passage, and I thought to myself, well, where was that rescinded? Why do we not have a daily public reading of Scripture? Paul hasn't returned yet. Was it, was it narrowly focused with returning to Timothy, or was it till he returns? I said, okay, I'll look at the larger view. So we had uh, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. public reading of Scripture in the sanctuary. We started, we did 30 minutes in the Old Testament, 30 minutes in the New Testament. It took 70 hours to read the Bible in its entirety. That's it, oh, wow. 70 wow. hours. So on the course of a year, you would read the Old Testament three and a half times. You would read the New Testament seven times. And people started coming out on their way to work. They would change their schedule or people who were re retired would come in. They'd have their Bibles open. I, I did the first year myself. I wasn't going to ask anybody to do something that I wasn't willing to do. But I committed myself to the daily public reading of Scripture. It was announced through the community, open to all, and people started to come and they were just hearing the word. Well, it was the most, some of the passages that I quote the most were passages that I heard for the first time. Had read them a thousand times, but heard for the first time as I was reading it out loud. That's where it really became more rhema to me than any study that I've ever done, was when I was actually reading it out loud. So I was seeing it, speaking it, 
and hearing it, three points of contact with the scripture at the same time by doing it out loud. Mm. And I became a big believer in hearing and listening to the Bible. So every morning when I walk the dog, I listen to the scriptures. Sometimes I, can, sometimes I can pay attention to them, but I don't think God cares whether you pay attention to them. He wants them to go in. You're, right. you're, you're, you're hearing them. They're going in. You may be looking out for cars or, or watching the dog, but they are definitely going in. We're talking with Dr. David Chadwick, as we do on the second Thursday of every month at the 10 o'clock hour. He's the author of Moving Beyond Anxiety and nine other books. and talking about the current conditions that uh, cause anxiety, uh, what we should be doing about it, how the end times, uh, which is of great interest to many people, opens up a whole new avenue of preparedness, of understanding what God's plan is, is draw, draw closer to Him in the difficult times. Maybe the pandemic has caused you to scatter as opposed to to gather, but yet this end time study puts you into the perspective of there is something that is going to come and God wants me to be prepared for it. And in that time of preparation, he also wants me to be active in the sharing of the gospel because this is part of the kingdom building. He didn't tell it to us to, for us to freeze in our steps, but to continue to advance the kingdom so the kingdom would be ready for these end time events. And that's the antidote to anxiety is activity, engagement in really being involved with the work of the Father. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to continue this conversation with Dr. David Chadwick. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, host of Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Revealing Prophecy, seen every week on the Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network. Our daily on-demand programming is available on our Apple and Android apps, and on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Android TV. We broadcast live Monday through Friday through our apps on our website, IgnitingNation.com, and on Facebook Live. You can listen daily on our audio platforms on Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, and iHeart. Our lineup of best-selling authors bring you the most in-depth biblical insights into the most pressing issues of our time, including prophecy, Israel, spiritual warfare, and a wide variety of contemporary Christian issues impacting the body of Messiah around the globe. If you missed the live show, you can always catch up on the Igniting Nation YouTube channel. Follow us on social media and join us as we endeavor to heal the nations with the Word of God. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to study right by my side through the Biblical Truth Library. Imagine having access to over 1,000 hours of audio and video teachings available to you through our website on a subscription basis or via our Apple and Android apps on an a la carte basis. Whichever method you choose, we promise to deliver new insights into the living Word of God as seen through the eyes of a Jewish believer. If you hunger and thirst like millions around the world for a deeper walk with God and the revelation of new understanding of the scriptures, visit IgnitingNation.com and click on the Biblical Truth Library or on any device with our free app. Don't let another day go by without receiving your heart's desire for a new depth of understanding into all of God's Word. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and my special featured guest twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, 
Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out, and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. And as we do on the second Thursday of every month in the 10 o'clock hour, we meet with the author of Moving Beyond Anxiety, Dr. David Chadwick. David, welcome back. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you. David, one of the phenomena, going back to the anxiety and uh, one of your areas of expertise, is a new form of social anxiety. I've now been um, homerated or homatized or, or uh, I've now become comfortable in my setting. Yeah. I spent a great deal of time uncomfortable in my setting, but then I got active in uh, remodeling or redecorating or finding things to do. And then there's a reluctance now to accept an invitation to go out because going out means I have to leave this safe nest that I've created. And uh, in the anxiety spectrums, okay, social anxiety, uh, is right there in the spectrum. Uh, there are people who are anxious about uh, social settings, but this has um, kind of exacerbated it to the point where people are becoming isolationists. And it's, they say they're okay, but we were built for community, so uh, you know, listen, I've been on my own single and on my own for eight years with a dog and, and um, I would say that I'm perfectly fine and not lonely or, uh, but I'm not socially ad ad averse. Uh, I have these gatherings. Uh, mine is more ecumenical in nature, not social in nature. Uh, but that's kind of the lifestyle of a pastor anyways, kind of a minister anyways, is that you know, we don't have as many social uh, engagements as we do ministerial engagements, and it, it goes with the territory. So what can people who are now turning away invitations and, and finding this shelter in place has become cocooning uh, how do we help them ease back out? Because the time is going to come when they're going to need to ease back out. Well, it's not really new to today, Eric. Um, for those who might remember in the mid-1990s, there was a book written by Robert Putnam, uh, an American mm -hmm. sociologist entitled Bowling Alone. 
and he was becoming alarmed with the number of people choosing to bowl alone that for years previously people in communities had always bowled in leagues and so the bowling activity was a part of a larger community and both were absolutely essential the physical exercise plus the community interchange for someone's psychosocial health but people during that time period uh, began, began to be because of the breakdown of the family the breakdown of marriage um, a lot of other issues to choose to bowl alone getting their physical exercise but not their social needs met and it was causing in Putnam's final analysis real mental unhealth uh, so even then people were encouraged more and more to be a part of some kind of community gathering well with that problem already existing and now you have the COVID pandemic which has exacerbated the problem uh, we've got to once again say to people loudly and clearly you can't bowl alone you can't live alone you must find ways to interact with people and as wonderful an invention as Zoom is to help us interact, it's not enough. You know, in neonatal intensive care, babies that are touched by the nurses and then those who are people of faith praying for those babies, the babies get healthier quicker and are stronger by that human touch. That's supposed to be a part of our life together. There's something powerful, as you know, as a man of God, about laying hands on people and anointing them with oil and praying for healing. There's intentionality there from God's perspective. There's power in touch. So I think the simple answer to your question is we've got to adjure people to come out of their homes. They've got to come together in in-person gatherings. They can't stay isolated. It's not healthy for them to do so. Just like your body needs physical exercise, it needs social exercise. Right. So I think you and I both just need to continue to encourage people to go together with other people to a place where they can interact, speak, touch, feel, and most importantly, pray with one another. You know, it's interesting that um, I'm an introvert who lives an extrovert's life. I think there's a lot of us out there that are like that. Uh, I'm, I've never been one to be comfortable going to a movie by myself. I, uh, I think that's kind of odd looking to me that, that, you know, why is that guy in the movie theater by himself? Uh, just never appealed to me. I wasn't one to go out to restaurants and have a meal by myself. You know, I'll, I'll cook something. Uh, <coughs> uh, but there are those that, that uh, struggle with this. They, they struggle with and, and find comfort in that isolation, but it's not healthy that uh, they not have that community. What's interesting is the new gathering of the brethren I got a chance a couple of Sundays ago and I actually did a, a video blog on it uh, I went to speak to a group of 20 women who were had their own Bible study and spent two hours in the word with them and it took me on a glimpse of the upper room and kind of gave me a foreshadowing of what the new assembly of the brethren might look like and that the church's role might be for larger gatherings more infrequently and fostering an environment of real deep passionate believers who want to go deep into end time prophecy they want to go deep into um, this particular area but the church is now the gathering place for the larger events. And instead of it being a full use facility, it's now a almost a special use facility because you fostered a gathering of these people. And then the pastor, then he kind of moves around uh, like I did. Uh, I brought seven points that I wanted to present to them. Uh, we prayed for a little bit and then it was two hours in the word interesting no praise mm -hmm. and worship two hours in the word and then for the next three days they had me on a text 
chain where they were texting each other. Uh, you know, did you get this point out of that? Did you get this point out of that? Rabbi, can you weigh in on this? And so it continued for two or three more days, and I was so impressed by it. And these are all highly educated, highly accomplished women who had all been heavily involved in their churches but found that during this COVID season, there's a smaller gathering of 20 who were like-minded digging into, and they're digging into the book of Revelation together, uh, digging mm -hmm. into this, uh, they needed a Jewish perspective on some matters and so asked me to come in to bring that. And uh, I, I did a, uh, uh, we have a program called Through the Lens, which is my video blog that goes out. Uh, and I did uh, a video blog on it saying, this may be the heartbeat of the Great Awakening. That if pockets like this broke out in every community and were encouraged and then these large facilities, well, maybe you don't need that large, large, large multi-campus facility. Maybe you have four, five, six large gatherings. Maybe they are gatherings where they are uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and there are deep workshops, and you bring in speakers, and you, you kind of set the tone for the next 12 weeks worth of uh, now go out into your groups and dig deep into these areas. Here's, here's a speaker on this and a speaker on this and a speaker on this. And it's just sending them out to and then have them grow their community and then split off into two smaller groups and let them bring people in. And it seemed like almost a new model of what the Acts chapter 2 church was like because the last line was, and God added to their number daily, those being saved, uh, is this a possibility of a new model that seems to be neighborhood driven, community driven, and exactly what you and I would like to see is real mm -hmm. growth at the street level, not right. at the pew level. Right. Well, it could well be, and you're asking a great question. Nobody really knows what the church is going to look like post COVID but a lot of people are asking the question, do we need all the buildings? Do we need the big show? Do we need the lights and camera and smoke? And, and if people coming together for an hour, hour, 10 minutes, and then checking the box saying, I've done my religious commitment for the week, and it's not really deepening them in Christ. I think the other question you're asking as well, Eric, is you and I both know that right now, one of the potential threats of our new government is religious liberties and First Amendment rights to speak and not being accused of hate speech. Well, if we are going to see a continued movement down the road of the clamping down on people's ability to speak the truth, um, you might very well be forced underground. And if that's the case, if persecution should come upon the church, then these smaller groups already in place would be the natural way for the Christian life to continue to expand. Interestingly, the nation in the world that has the largest outgrowth and growth of Christian converts right now is Iran. And obviously they can't meet publicly, but they can meet privately like you're talking and they're doing that and the word of God is being exposed and they are growing in exponentially large numbers right now. Well, wow, it's exciting. You know, I, I will tell you, it's such exciting times. And for those out there that have this gloom and doom and this worry and this trouble, and I got to tell you that all is well with my soul. I am more excited than I've ever been. I'm looking forward to the changes that are coming. I'm excited about it, and I want our audience to be excited about it. We've been talking with Dr. David Chadwick, author of Moving Beyond Anxiety. If you're interested in the book, just go to today's broadcast lineup on ignitinganation.com, and it says, like the interview, get the book, click on that link, we'll get that book right over to you. Dr. David Chabuck, we look forward to seeing you on the second Thursday of every month at 10 o'clock, and I'll be seeing you up there for Good Friday at uh, Word of Hope Church um, in Charlotte, Moments of Hope Church in Charlotte, North Carolina for a Passover Seder. And we're gonna celebrate the Lord's Supper and give new insights to your family of faith into Exodus chapter 12 and how that plays out. We are so excited about having you, Eric, and look forward to that evening with you. It'll be just wonderful. What a way to prepare for Easter. 
We're so excited. So thank you for that. And I will see you next month. And then I will see you again right up there in Charlotte. God bless you, my thank friend. You. Love to Marilyn and the family. Enjoy. And may the Lord bless all the works to your hands. Thank you. And shalom to you, my friend. Shalom, shalom. All right. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.